Good morning and welcome everyone to this presentation about the deep water depositional processes. Uh, during this speech we are going to discuss the importance of field studies to recognize a sedimentary process in the deep water uh, realm, the water, deep water environment. Uh, during the last uh, 30 years, we had the opportunity to work in uh, several basins around the world from different countries. So we had the opportunity to work uh, with uh, outcrops and core examples of deep water deposits. So uh, it's very important to, to un carefully analyze the characteristic of these deposits seen we still can have access to a lot of information about sedimentary processes from describing the rocks. Uh, so this is the main organization of this presentation. We are going to move from objectives, uh, discussion of fluid and sediment gravity flow, deep water element and processes, key, key observation for re reading deep water processes from the deposits and the rock uh, to understand and to discuss the characteristic of long lived and fluctuating sediment laid in turbulent flow from the deposits uh, to discuss some criteria of distinction between turbidity current and bottom current deposit and then the conclusion. So, as a summary, the objectives will be to analyze the limitation of flume experiments to recreate and to copy the scales of sediment gravity flows in nature. As you know, uh, nature are processes, the po the positional processes in nature are so, uh, sometimes so big and the scales can be different. Uh, it's very difficult to recreate these scales in a flume experiment. So we are going to discuss the importance of field studies to understand sedimentary processes yeah, in this uh, natural scale. We are going to review some critical sedimentary structures that provide some clues to unravel deep water sedimentary processes. And the idea is finally to provide some diagnostic criteria for distinguishing between turbidity and bottom current deposits. So I would like to, I, I would like to start this uh, presentation with a short, a short recognition to all those geologists that provide some uh, new understanding to deep water processes and uh, to very new understanding of the deep water for the deep water environment just describing and analyzing the rocks. Uh, this is, for example, Arnold Bouma, who discovered uh, the very simple Bouma sequence. We know not that as a Bouma sequence, the, which is uh, uh, Da Vinci said, for example, the, the more simple is the ultimate sophistication. So that's real. Sometimes it's much more difficult to get something simple respect to get something complicated. So in this case, the success of the Bowman simple, uh, the Bowman sequence is that provide a simple explanation for uh, such a complex environment. So uh, I want to highlight this uh, phrase of, uh, from Arnold Bowman. Bowman said that in the field, we still have a lot of, of discoveries, but uh, of course, there won't be the computer that tell us what all the, the rock means. For that, we had to go back to the rock again. And uh, it's very interesting because every time we go back to the, to the field, we have new achievements, we had the opportunity to access to new understanding. So another important geologist, just uh, some of them, uh, the Italian geologist Carlo Ippolito Migliorini. Migliorini was the first in understand the origin 
of grounded beds as related to sediment gravity flows in the Massigno Fleece and make a revolution in the uh, sedimentological understanding. It make a revolution that deeply influenced all the sedimentologists of the 20th century. And also John Sanders. John Sanders make a lot of fundamental understanding just uh, describing the rocks. Sanders found uh, uh, inertia, uh, found evidence from the rock that uh, proves the existence of inertia flows, flow bipartition, flow transformation, and also he carefully documented the transition between planar lamination and ripples, and also discussed the origin of flames. And of course, our professor Bouma. Bouma start making a first uh, interpretation of a phase track. Phase track is very important because allow us to predict what kind of phases we are going to have in a more deeper position. So the Bouma sequence is not a sequence to recognize turbidites. Bouma knew, knew that these deposits were turbidite, but he recognized these different uh, intervals just to predict and to see, to map the distribution of these different phases along this deep water landscape. So the, 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 the simple Bouma sequences uh, influence generation of sedimentary geologies. The message, for example, for me, from Bouma was just listen to the rock and you will access or you will have the opportunity to access to a new understanding, to evident and at present hidden information. So uh, sometimes uh, it's very difficult to us to read the rock and to try to get new understanding from the rock. But Bouma, the message from Bouma is is possible to transform nature into culture. So when we go into, into models, it's much more easy to understand and to uh, get a more precise understanding of the whole basin and also the deep water environment itself. So uh, just uh, reviewing some of the uh, advances by John Sanders, John Sanders just looking this evidence of these quartz grained pockets with sediments. Uh, Sanders discovered that uh, this pocket probably filled by a flow that goes with the quartz material at the head. So this is the first uh, design of a uh, uh, inertia flows. It's an inertia flows in one in which you have the quartz material in the front of the flow, followed by uh, fine grained materials of the turbulent cloud, forming some kind of um, fast moving basal inertia flows and slow moving turbulent flow. This is the first step of flow bipartition and also high inertia flows. Flow bipartition and high inertia flow was documented uh, 30 years uh, after the, the discovery of Sanders. But Sanders don't need to go to the deep water or don't need to make flume experiment. Just carefully describing and analyzing the, the rocks, he gets it, this very important conclusion. Also, for example, this is very, very, the, the work of John Sanders was very clear, clever, was very, very smart because uh, in this Polish section, uh, Sander document the lateral transition between planar lamination and claiming ripples. And now we know that this transition represents a decrease in flow velocity. But uh, according to Sanders, claiming ripples and planar lamination represent both sedimentary structures related to a similar origin, probably related to traction plus fallout from a turbulent suspension.
but uh, it's very interesting because just with a simple obs uh, observation and a correct interpretation, we can understand processes from the fossil rock. We don't need to perform very complicated flume experiment to understand that planar lamination are laterally equivalent to climate ripples. So, uh, I would like to go a little, I uh, discuss a little about the limitations of flume experiments. As you know, in nature we have these two kind of uh, flows, in Newtonian, flow, Newtonian fluids, we have fluid gravity flows in which a fluid, also a stream flow, can, can, we, can be, for example, water running by the effect of the gravity, uh, moves and drags the sediment in the bottom. But for the other side, we have sediment gravity flows. In sediment gravity flow, gravity affects the suspended sediment and the fluid is a lubricant for the movement. So it's very important because gravity is different in these two kind of uh, flu, the two kind of flows. For example, fluid gravity flows cannot happen under water and, uh, unless you have, for example, a marine current of a bottom current in the deep, uh, in the deep water environment. But sediment gravity flow, as the gravity acts on the grains or on the sediment, you can have sediment gravity flow are dominant in the deep water environment. Uh, fluid gravity flows are the most uh, common for us. We can easily uh, study the fluid gravity flows because just uh, if we have a stream of uh, clear water or sediment free water uh, moving in one direction over a uh, bottom of uh, loose uh, sediment, you can have sedimentary structures and at the boundary between this moving flow and the sediments on the bottom. You are going to have a lot of sedimentary structures. These sedimentary structures represent the um, equilibrium forms in between a fluid moving at some velocity. Here you have different velocities, you increasing velocities on this side, and in the other side you have different grain size. For example, in, in fine grain sand, if you increase the velocity, you are going to generate the ripples, and if you increase the velocity, you are going to have plain planar lamination, and finally, a supercritical flow, you are going to have anti-dunes. Or you, if, if the grain size is a little higher, or the little quartz grain size, you are going to, can, you can generate dunes or cross bedding. But it's very interesting because in uh, fluid gravity flow, it's not possible to generate massive sands. You, we, we cannot accumulate massive sandstone, or you, can, you cannot generate climbing ripples from the, in these experiments of in open channel, just moving clear water uh, over uh, loose sediment. So if we, if we want to understand this sedimentary structure related to sediment gravity flow, we can uh, have, uh, we can, we had to make flume experiment with other parameters. Like, we had to take into consideration not only velocity, flow velocity and grain size and flow depth, we also had to put into consideration flow competence, flow capacity, flow or sediment concentration, the concentration, the volume of sediments in between the flow, flow duration and also the rate of sediment fallout. This is very important because in a uh, natural environment, it's much more common to have deposits related to sediment gravity flow. But uh, these sediment gravity flows are very difficult to be uh, created or to be uh, modeled in a lab, to model in a flume, because uh, we, it's very difficult to recreate the scales of the natural scales 
in a flu. We can understand some limited part of sediment gravity flow using some flumes. We can use circular flumes. In these circular flumes, you have here uh, water with sediment in suspension. You put this sediment into suspension and then you decrease this velocity so the sediment fell very quickly and in this, with these flumes you can create, for example, massive sandstone or claiming ripple, but just uh, for uh, some uh, a couple of seconds of one minute. It's not, you cannot sustain this flow because the amount of sediment you have in suspension is very limited. And the same from these uh, reservoir flumes. In reservoir flumes, you, you here create in this tank a mixture of water and sediment and then you release this uh, sediment into the flume and you can create this turbidity current and accumulate a limited, a limited very limited thickness of uh, deposits uh, according to this uh, sediment gravity flow. But anyway, it's so difficult to create uh, very big uh, sediment gravity flows because we have no uh, enough uh, big uh, tanks, for example, or circular flumes to create the scales we have in nature. So again, it's very important to understand the uh, processes from uh, sediment gravity flows uh, 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 from the study of fossil deposit. Fossil deposit. In fossil deposit, you have the highest, the highest resolution and uh, if the outcrops are in good condition, you have good exposures, you probably can uh, make uh, outstanding uh, analysis of uh, uh, sedimentary structures and from sedimentary structures you can understand better the origin of these sediment gravity flows. So, I would like to discuss with you some uh, deep water elements and processes as a summary uh, to locate, for example, the, 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 the main concept we have uh, for turbidity currents and bottom currents. Uh, at the beginning, uh, turbidite, for example, is a word that sometimes for many people uh, relate turbidite with turbulent flows, uh, it, which is not correct. For example, the original significance of turbidites and turbidity currents came from Johnson. Johnson in 1939 coined the term turbidity current for essentially for sediment lady density current. Turbidity current is a density current because turbidity refers to turbid, not to turbulent. Hmm? This is the it's not uh, it's, it's a mistake for most uh, may, or many sedimentologists to relate turbidity with turbulent flows uh, because the turb turbid is not any reference of turbid between turbid and turbulence. For example, the milk is uh, turbid, but it's not turbulent because the different the part in, in a in a turbid flow the sediment can be sustained by different mechanisms. You can sustain the sediment by internal cohesion, by grain-to-grain -grain interaction, but uh, by water scape or by turbulence. You have uh, multiple mechanisms of sustaining the sediment in between the flow and to create a turbid flow, a density flow. So, uh, for, th for this reason, uh, any kind of sediment-laden density current can be considered a turbidity current. For example, cohesive debris flow, hyperconcentrated flow, concentrated flow, sediment laden turbulent flow are all turbidity currents. Uh, turbidites are all those deposits accumulated by turbidity currents, as uh, the discussion of Muti in 1992. In reference to the origin, turbidites can be intravaginal or extravaginal. Intravaginal turbidites are those turbidites generating between, in between the basin. So, intravaginal material are uh, 
redeposited or are redeposited or are eroded and accumulated but in between the basin. Extra basinal turbidites are originated outside the basin, for example during a river flood. Mm, the river carries uh, a transport, a mixture of water and sediment and this water and sediment accumulate in the basin. So, since the source of the material is external, so we call this extravasional turbidites. And finally, we have this uh, bottom current. Bottom currents can reshape the bottom of the basin uh, can, or can re-elaborate the bottom of the basin and uh, uh, make some erosion and transport of the previous deposit on the bottom. Uh, it's very interesting because uh, this do, these uh, two different uh, processes, turbidite currents, we have intrabasinal and extrabasinal, but both are part of sediment gravity flows. Mm -hmm. and in both cases, you have sediment gravity acting on the sediment and different sedimentary structures like uh, normal gravity bed, intrabasinal components. In the, uh, components in the case of extrabasinal turbidites, we have a uh, composite bed also, or more complex, internally complex bed. We have extrabasinal, a mixture of extrabasinal and intrabasinal components, extrabasinal components like uh, plant remains, like uh, trees or all, all kind of material transported from the continent. And also we have lofting, rhythmized lofting, provided or, or generated by the change in the flow density due to the effect of the fresh water. Uh, for on the other side, in the bottom currents, uh, bottom currents are essentially sediment-free currents. So you cannot generate some kind of sedimentary structures related to sediment gravity flow by bottom currents. Bottom currents cannot accumulate massive sandstone, for example. The main kind of deposits of the, uh, from bottom currents are uh, traction structures like uh, subcritical ripples, like uh, um, dunes, for example, but you cannot accumulate a massive sandstone by bottom currents. We are going to discuss this later on. Just uh, to show some example, uh, intrabasinal and extrabasinal turbidites can happen in the same the same basin. For example, this is an example from Venezuela, from the Guarico Fleece, in which you in the same outcrop you have this on the lower part, this uh, massive sandstone with the dish waterscape structure, quartz grain massive sandstone related to uh, intrabasinal process processes. This is a granular flow, uh, concentrated flow, inertia flow, typical of intrabasinal condition. And on top, you, above these surfaces, you this surface, you have an extrabasinal turbidite. This extrabasinal turbidite with fluctuating flow conditions, that's the reason you have massive laminated, massive and laminated again. And on top, you have this very big coal clast. This coal clast is part of extravisional material transported by the flow. So, in the same deposit, you can, you can have intravisional and extravisional turbidite. Uh, okay, we, the idea now is to discuss some key observation. We can, some information we can read on the rock which is uh, useful to understand the depositional condition or the positional process in sediment gravity flow. Uh, one uh, very important sedimentary structure which is uh, sometimes is overlooked uh, is uh, imbrication. For most uh, sedimentologists, imbrication just suggests flow direction. So if we have a class, an elongated class, and you have a current going this way, the class we can rotate and get a more stable position. So for many, for most uh, sedimentologists, if you see imbrication, you can take a paleocurrent from your comp from using your compass. But uh, imbrication also give another 
information. Another critical important information for understanding sediment gravity flow processes. Imbrication means that the class was able to roll. So if the class was able to roll, means that the class was free to roll. So with the matrix and the flow was non-cohesive, was a Newtonian flow, because in a cohesive flow, all the class are sustained by the matrix cohesion. So it's not possible to rot rotate individually the class. The class it moves as uh, same thing in between a cohesive flow in a plastic or in, in a cohesive non-Newtonian flow. Uh, if you have uh, imbrication means you are in a Newtonian uh, flow, in a fluid flow. So uh, now we are going to see a video that shows the progressive accumulation of a massive sulfur bed with a little bit of coarse grain material and in which we have together the accumulation in uh, suspended load and bed load at the same time. Suspended load made the, the positional surface to rise progressively. At the same time, if we have bed load, this bed load can create isolated clasp and also can create uh, imbricated clasp. This is a flow experiment by Gary Parkett that made some years ago. Uh, here you have suspended load cloth and at the same time bed load. As you can see in the video, the, the positional surface is rising. At the same time you have deposit and this rising the positional surface. So if you make uh, some drawing here marking the different timelines, you can see that the, the positional surface is rising and you also can have here some isolated floating clasp. The floating clasp, for example, if uh, we take into consideration conventional interpretation, you can say, okay, this floating clasp represents or suggests a cohesive flow, which is not true. It's a deposit gradually accumulating from a turbulent flow with suspended load and at the same time bed load which results in the accumulation of this floating, cl floating clasp. Here in the lower part you have a cartoon showing a diagram for the accumulation from the, in this hyperpignal flow or long lived hyperpignal flow in which you have these composite beds on the bottom with the, this imbricated clasp that appear floating in between these uh, sandstones. So, uh, what means this uh, uh, clay clast or imbricated clay clast? When clast are dragged as bed load below a cloth or suspended load, imbricated clast can appear, can appear floating, uh, like here. Uh, you have this clast floating, but this clast floating because of uh, a process we know that is the hindered settling. You cannot go uh, to the lower part of the deposit because you have already have massive sandstone. So this clast can appear aligned or can appear imbricated flow uh, along some uh, depositional surfaces which is rising. And uh, it's very important to understand that from this evidence we can get the correct understanding of the depositional processes. The flow was not cohesive was a fluid flow. So it's very important no, not to confuse this sandstone with floating class with deposits of sandy debris flow. These are not sandy debris flow because sandy debris flows are by definition cohesive and this deposit is produced by a non-cohesive flow. Uh, here are some examples of this um, bed lot deposit in between massive sand, for example, Majaro Fleece in Trinidad, or Achimov Formation in Russia, or in Pampatar Formation in Venezuela, you can clearly see here the clast is isolated clay clast, for example, in between well-sorted massive sandstones and imbrication. Imbrication means the flow was going this way, but also very important, Imbrication suggests that this flow was fluid flow and the accumulation was 
gradual. The same, some other example here on, on, on the right uh, about this uh, from the offshore of Brazil, the typical, typical turbidite from the campus basin in Brazil, Los Moje formation in Argentina and the Austral basin in below. Uh, so imbrication again means that the, the, this deposit was accumulated by a progressively a grading flow with this uh, floating is isolated cluster hmm? like uh, we, we can see here this class means that uh, the accumulation was progressive and the class was transported as bedlock another interesting uh, structure i would like to discuss with you today is flames uh, flames for example is like a mud injection uh, John Sanders in 1965 described uh, this kind of flame in which you have a mud intraction. This is a soapy interval, a very, uh, an interval which is supported or saturated in water. Then when you uh, start to accumulate the sediment, you can have this injection. In this case, you have different cross bedding, like I put this number here, one, two, three, that means that this injection happened at the same time you have the position in, at the least side in these uh, ripples. But not all flames form in this way. It's very interesting to discuss and to understand the origin of flames in below massive sandstone, in below well-sorted massive fine-grained sa massive sandstone. Uh, this is, uh, these are some examples from the Austral Basin in Argentina or the Majaro Formation in Trinidad in deep water. Uh, these flames, you can see here some shale, you can also can have also sandstone here, but it which is saturated in water and when you start to accumulate this, the, this shale start to inject. But uh, here we can get two more, two very important information. First of all, accumulation is, uh, the, the position is gradual. As this gradual accumulation evolves, you can progress with the injection. And at the same time, these flames give some indication about the rheology of the flow. This, because you have these flames, you have this deflection here, because the flow in the lower part was laminar. So this part, of the flame moves a lower velocity with respect to this part, which is a typical characteristic of laminar flow. In the, in the lower part, you see this spectacular example of this flame injecting the lower part of the laminar flow, of the slow moving laminar flow, in which you can see this deflection progressively deforms this, uh, this uh, shale laminar. So, two typical, two important uh, conclusions here. In this um, cartoon, you can see uh, some uh, how the flames form. You have the initial, initial deposition, and this is part of the laminar flow, and on top you have the turbulent flow. This is a flow uh, transformation in the sense of fissure, a gravity transformation between the turbulent flow and the laminar flow below, and uh, this uh, mud inject the lower part of the laminar flow, so you have this deflection. So, very important. At the same time, if you recognize flame structure or massive sandstone, that, that means the deposition was gradual, and at the same time, the deposition of the, this massive sandstone was in a laminar form, at the base of uh, turbulent flow. The turbulent flow continuously provides the fine grained sediment. The sediment concentrate in the lower part, as you see here, the two, these two curves, according to Neller and Brane, you have the concentration in green, which is increasing down, uh, downward the flow, and velocity. Velocity is decreasing until zero, you have the deposit. So this lower part is, is, is you, you have here a high concentration and low velocity that create the condition of a laminar flow. So 
Uh, I would like to discuss now some characteristic of uh, long-lived sediment-laden turbulent flow from ancient deposit. Uh, this is a close-up of the track with the phases track we use to analyze uh, hyperpignal flows. Uh, I would like to discuss with you this transition between uh, bed load deposit, this is massive sandstone or sandstone with some uh, lamination, uh, this lamination with the imbricated clust and going into massive sandstone laminated and claiming ripples. Uh, in below you can see this transition from this uh, sandstone with clay clust, imbricated clust, massive sandstone, lamination and finally claiming ripples. I put here some leaves because this, uh, is, this cartoon is for uh, hyperpignal flows. It's very interesting because, <coughs> for example, according, due to the, or just discussing the origin of this deposit, as uh, we discussed early, uh, this uh, massive sandstone with the imbricated clust are related to this uh, traction uh, below a turbulent flow and the progressive aggradational of this uh, massive sandstone. At the same time you have aggradation and you have bed load. So you can have this uh, aligned levels with pebbles and imbricated clust. Uh, this is the main origin of phases B3. And also when we go into massive sandstone, massive sandstone accumulate from gradually and also in a laminar shape at the bottom of uh, the turbulent suspension. Uh, this is the diagram of uh, Neller and Brane, or the original with some modification. You have a turbulent flow and below a laminar flow with a, the, produced by a decrease in flow velocity and increase in flow concentration. So, this make in the this create in the lower part of the flow a zone of low velocity and high concentration high concentration that uh, don't allow to generate sedimentary structure so you go into the accumulation of massive sandstone massive sandstone of course also uh, and uh, laminar flows are also indicated or suggested by these flames often you can have at the bottom of massive sandstone. Another interesting structure, if you decrease the, this uh, transition interval, we uh, increase concentration and decrease velocity very fast, <coughs> you have very high shear stress at the bottom. So you can go into laminar uh, parallel lamination. So parallel lamination and massive sandstone represent similar condition or similar velocity, but the difference is in planar lamination you don't have this transition area of high concentration of sediment that is related to the laminar flow. And finally you have claiming ripples. Claiming ripples are, is a typical sedimentary structure of traction plus fallow processes in which uh, you can have a total, total preservation here of the stoss size and lee size. That means that the sediment was supplied from above, from a turbulent flow, which is collapsing part of the, part of the suspended lot. So at the same time, to produce uh, these beautiful claiming ripples, you, you need to sustain the flow for a while. So it's a uh, sustained and long lived turbulent flow. Uh, as a summary here, it's very common in the rock record to see these transitions from uh, laminar sandstone, uh, for massive sandstone, bed load deposit, massive sandstone and bed load deposits again. This transition can happen vertically but also laterally and also between massive sandstone, la plan lamination, massive sandstone, plan lamination, massive sandstone again, or be in between uh, ripples, laminate, plan lamination, ripples, plan lamination, and ripple again. Uh, 
This, uh, this, uh, all this transition means are, are related to variation in flow velocity, flow capacity, flow concentration, and all different flow rheologies that uh, during a flow which is sustained and fluctuate along the time. So uh, this is a cartoon showing how this variation looks like along the horizontal and also vertical. In a vertical scale you can see this transition between massive and bed lot. This is an example representing this change probably in the uh, competence, the flow competence. So you can see here transition between massive and laminated probably represented this change in the uh, rate of sediment followed and finally the transition between planar lamination and claiming ripples at the end which represents change in flow velocity. Here is a summary of the different uh, changes, for example, decrease in flow competence, overall decrease in flow competence and fluctuation in flow competence, decrease in the rate of sediment fallout, and again fluctuation in the rate of sediment fallout in the vertical, and also decrease in flow velocity and in the vertical fluctuation in flow velocity. How we can recognize all these changes in flow rheology from a deposit. Okay, uh, finally, I would like to uh, discuss some distinguishing criteria between turbidity current and bottom current deposit. Sometimes it's very difficult for sedimentologists to recognize, uh, to be sure that we are dealing with. Uh, uh, deposit related to a sediment gravity flow or deposit related to a bottom current. It's very important to understand that bottom currents are not sediment gravity flow. Bottom currents are essentially water free currents. So you can erode, you can re-elaborate, you can make tra traction, but always on the deposit we ha already have in the bottom. So if you have sediment gravity flow, a bottom current can erode and can transport the deposit. So the main characteristic of the deposit uh, related to bottom currents will be these erosional surfaces. Erosional surfaces, that means that uh, sediment-free currents go this way and erode the deposit. And also these subcritical ripples. Subcritical ripples are typical of uh, bottom currents. You cannot accumulate claiming ripples in bot by bottom currents. Uh, you can accumulate dunes, for example, of all kind of sedimentary structures related to fluid gravity flow. Bottom currents are essentially fluid gravity flows. Uh, in, in on the right you have some beautiful example from San Luis formation in Argentina where you can find uh, hundreds of meters of ripples uh, accumulated by these bottom currents at the margin of the Gongwana uh, supercontinent. Uh, yeah, well, to, to get some, to make some summary about the characteristic of uh, uh, sediment gravity flows or turbidites uh, with res in respect to bottom currents on the right. Uh, as we discussed earlier, sediment gravity flow or turbidites are a typical, you have typical uh, structure from traction blue fallout. You can have massive sandstone, you have implicated class in between mass uh, sandstone, floating class, or claiming ripples, like in this case. This case in the Austral Basin, these claiming ripples are typical related to turbidite. But on the other side, in the example of the Columbus Basin, you have this erosional and uh, subcritical ripples relating to bottom currents. Bottom currents in this case are fluid gravity flows in contrast with these sediment gravity flows which are um, related to turbidite. So, uh, some uh, conclusion. Uh, sediment gravity flow processes and related sedimentary structures cannot be understood by conventional flume experiment. It, this is very important because the volume and duration of natural flows 
are beyond the limits of any kind of flume. We have not the technology to create the scale or to understand the scale of nature. So the only tool we have is the careful, carefully analysis and interpretation of sedimentary structures in fossil deposits. This is very important to go to the field and to try to understand sedimentary processes by thinking and imagine the process in the rock and support that with evidence and with the geological criteria. So uh, is this, the last is very important because it's, 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 very, it's fundamental to support all the interpretation with very good photograph, field evidence, and explain what the proposed geological criteria was used to get that understanding or to get to, 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 get to that interpretation. So uh, finally, geologists and sedimentology, especially in the industry, need to have more clear and diagnostic criteria to guide the interpretation. Field studies are fundamental to provide this required understanding. It's, this is very important because sometimes we go into the discussion if we, the flow is turbulent or not turbulent. But uh, sometimes this is not the main problem we have. We had the problem of trying to understand how is the distribution of sandstone body, how is the distribution of the tur this turbidites, and we, how we can predict the extension continuity of this sandstone reservoir. So we need to have more strong and clear criteria to identify the different processes from the analysis of the fossil rocks from cores and to extrapolate that into logs, well logs and seismic. So, Thank you very much for your attention and uh, we are waiting for discussion and comments.